This is Research Like a Pro, Episode 36, Church Records, Part 2. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogy professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at FamilyLocket.com and the creators of the Amazon best-selling book, Research Like a Pro, A Genealogist's Guide. I'm Nicole, co-host of the podcast. Join Diana and me as we discuss how to stay organized, make progress in our research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Nicole Dyer, co-host of the Research Like a Pro Genealogy podcast. I'm here with accredited genealogist Diana Elder. Today, we're talking about church records again. It's part two. So hi, Diana. How are you? I am doing wonderful. So excited to be here and talking more about church records. So what are you working on in your client research this week? Well, I'm actually getting started on, I have three big projects to do this month. And it's kind of fun because they're all different. One is way back in Virginia, 1700s. Another one is Tennessee and Virginia kind of a migration. And then another one is early 1900s and it's a DNA case. So I'm super excited to tackle that and especially using DNA Painter and the new tools on Ancestry. It came along just at the perfect time for me to do this DNA project. So I'm really looking forward to, you know, doing some really varied research this month in all sorts of different areas and time periods which is why I love doing client research. It's so fun to just do all sorts of different types of projects. Yeah, it is. It's interesting. I've learned so much from the client projects that I've done, especially because people usually bring their most difficult problem to you. So then you really have to dive in and figure it out. Yeah. And it was fun because in February, I solved a case and it turned out to be two men of the same name very, very similar name, not the same name exactly, but their records have been completely mixed up. Immigration records and city directories and a census had these two men completely mixed up and it had sent the client off on a different path to research. And so it was really fun to be able to straighten that out and now have a whole new area open up for the client to now try to figure out what happened to her ancestor who disappears after 1930. They thought he was in Massachusetts. Turns out he'd emigrated to Canada, which is kind of a huge difference if you're trying to figure out where somebody went and what happened to them. Wow. (laughs) Yep, it was fun. All right, well, let's dive into our podcast today. And first, let's do a review. So this is a review from Bill. And he says, this is a great podcast for both beginning and experienced genealogists. Beginners can learn the how to do genealogy the right way from the start. I wish this process was around when I started genealogy. I would have saved a lot of time and effort. Experienced genealogists will learn something new from the discussion of the various tools and tech that Nicole and Diana use. The other thing I love about this podcast is the quality of the audio. The discussion of the topics is very clear and easy to listen to in the car, and there's no annoying bumper music or other useless content. Highly recommended. Well, thank you so much for that great review, Bill. I think it's super great that we figured out how to get our audio good. It took me a little bit to get the right microphone and the right setup. So thanks for patience with us from the very beginning. All right, Nicole, you're going to give us a little clarification from the last podcast where we talked about the Julian and Gregorian calendars, and neither one of us could quite remember the exact year. So go ahead and bring us up to date on what you've (laughs) discovered since then. So the previous calendar before the Gregorian calendar was instituted, it was called the Julian calendar, and that was instituted in 46 BC and was named after Julius Caesar. And I'm kind of just getting this from the Family Search Wiki. So if you want to learn more about it, go to the Family Search Wiki and put in Julian and Gregorian calendars. So the part that I mentioned in our last episode was that if you have a church record that occurred in the British Empire before 1752, just know that it will be on the Julian calendar, which that calendar starts with the month of March. And then the last month of the year is January. Then after 1752 with the Gregorian calendar, the years started to begin with January and then December. 
So if you're just aware of that, then you can convert the months and the dates. And especially on those Quaker marriage records or baptism records in the Quaker church, they only use the number of the month and not the full name of the month because they thought it was pagan. So just remember the Julian calendar came first and then the Gregorian came after in the British Empire after 1752. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. And one of the things that you can do to avoid any confusion is to write the date with both years' numbers. For example, you could write 14 February 1699 slash 1700. So at the time, it would have been considered 1699 according to the Julian calendar, but now it would be considered 1700 according to the Gregorian calendar. So don't you just love having this extra confusion on numbers? You know, as genealogists, <laughs> we have to deal with so many things. Can't believe we have to deal with this too. But, you know, for anyone listening, it's just good to be aware of these things. And we don't have to remember all this stuff. It's just if in the back of your brain, you can think, oh, wait, I remember something about that. Then you just do a Google search or look on the Family Search Wiki, and then you'll be able to figure out how to do that and use that in your own research. So today we're doing church records part two, and we're talking about how to find those records. Last episode, we talked all about the value of church records and some of the great things you can find in them, because we'll be honest, it's not as easy as looking up the census or, you know, ordering a birth certificate for someone. This is a little bit deeper research, but if you've got a brick wall or you want to really do your reasonably exhaustive research, you can't ignore church records. And it's well worth your time in learning about them and doing some exploration in them and trying to find them. Now, the first thing that you need to do is figure out what church they attended. And there's a lot of different clues we can use to get that. One of those things would be family sources, like a family Bible or a funeral program or where they are buried. Is it a church cemetery? Is there some type of a little symbol on the headstone that's affiliated with the church? We have to open up our minds and look at everything around us to try to figure it out. Maybe your family has always been Catholic and they were Catholic hundreds of years ago. Or maybe, like mine, they just bounced around. They're in the South and they just went to whatever church was available. And I have a history from my great aunt. And she says that very thing, that they just went to the neighborhood church. And it was no affiliation. It was there in early 1900s in Oklahoma. I ended up writing, or I think I called the local genealogical society or library historian, can't think of what her actual title was, and asked her about church records. And she said, no, we don't have anything like that in this little area. So you never know what you're going to find, but you do have to try to figure out what church they attended and family sources or figuring out what church the descendants went to could be helpful. Now, Nicole did a really fun religion pedigree as part of one of her assignments. So Nicole, tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Yeah. I'm taking the Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy virtual class called Intermediate Foundations. And one of our lectures was all about religion and discovering the ancestors' religions in our families. So our assignment was to create a pedigree just showing the religions of everybody in our family. So starting with myself and then going back. And we only had to do four generations, but I couldn't stop because I was having so much fun. So I think I did like eight. Mm -hmm. But I found that I had so many more religions in my pedigree than I thought. And one of the things that I noticed was that the religion was kind of passed on from generation to generation. So on the elder side, we have all of the Catholic block of ancestors, you know, I gave them the orange color. So I have this big block of orange in the top of my pedigree because those were all of my elder ancestors and they all continued to be Catholic for several generations until my great grandfather became a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. And then we have a bunch of Quakers on my grandma's side, Grandma Hollingsworth, like I mentioned last time. So I could see that the Quakers, that was a huge block of pink in my pedigree that went back several generations back to Ireland. And then I have a lot of Danish ancestors who are all members of the Denmark State Church, which was Evangelical Lutheran. So I gave them all the color blue. 
So anyway, if you have the chance to make a pedigree showing your ancestors' religions, it could really open up a lot of cool records to go search. I had done a lot of research in Church of England records just because when you're doing British research before civil registration, that's what you look in is the church records. But I hadn't realized that we had so many other church affiliations in our pedigree to look at. And it was cool to see how it was passed on from generation to generation, just because that's where they lived and that was their culture and that was what happened. I love your religion pedigree. I'm just afraid that if I would do it, my entire paternal side would have nothing because my Southern ancestors didn't leave me very many helps with knowing what church they went to. But I did find one. So my ancestor that I have talked about so much, Thomas Beverly Royston, one little clue The only clue I have is that he deeded four acres of his land to the deacons of the Baptist Church at Mount Hickory Meeting in Chambers County, Alabama. So I thought, okay, if he is deeding some of his land to the Baptist Church, that's a good clue. He was Baptist. And I did look for microfilm at the Family History Library and did some research on primitive Baptist churches in Alabama. But that church wasn't included, so I need to continue my search for that in a local library or historical society or some other repository. So that was a land record. Hmm. Kind of interesting where we might find records. What other kind of records do you think might help us find religious clues? There's so many, but before I say any more, I had to give an example of a, a cemetery record. The gravestone of our ancestor my ancestor on dad's side, Benjamin Elder, he has a very cool tombstone that has a big cross on it. And then it has a book at the top. And sometimes on gravestone inscriptions, that book can symbolize the scriptures, or it could symbolize the book of life. And the picture on find a grave isn't very clear. So I can't really see exactly what it is. But he is buried in St. Martin of Tours Cemetery in Meade County, Kentucky. So from what I've already said in this episode in the last, you're probably guessing that he was Catholic. And you're right, because all the elders were Catholic in Maryland and then moved on to Kentucky. So that was a cool kind of record that stands the test of time, those gravestones. And whatever symbols they have on there could be great clues to you. And then, of course, which cemetery it is. I mean, I think that's probably the best. If it's a church cemetery, you know they're probably affiliated with that church. Although I have seen some people buried in a church cemetery that weren't affiliated with that church just because it was the only cemetery in the town or the closest and most convenient one. So you can look into the cemetery history to kind of understand why people might have been buried there. (laughs) Let's talk about some other records that could help you know what religion your ancestor was newspapers, like if there was an obituary, the obituary could give the name of the officiating minister at the funeral. And any other details in the newspaper could also tell you I was doing a project about Mariah Keaton. And in her obituary, it said that she was a member of the Methodist Church in Anderson County, South Carolina for 22 years. So it not only gave me her religion, but how long she had lived in that area and been a member of that church. Also, you can look in civil marriage records for an affiliation with the church by just noticing the name of the minister. So if you're looking at like a county marriage record and it says the name of the person who signed that record or that license or whatever, it could be that their title is given as minister of the gospel or minister of whatever church it is. And that could give you a clue to go look at the church records for that denomination. Another record to look at are the city directories. And often the city directories will tell what churches existed in that area. And if you're really lucky, it could tell you that your specific relative is a part of a certain church. So you never know what those city directories could tell. And then Diana mentioned looking at a land record for a deed to a certain denomination or religious institution. So I had an example like that as well in the Keaton family where one of the sons of William Keaton deeded his land after he died to the reverend of the Methodist church. And then another brother was buried in the cemetery of the Methodist church. 
Mariah was also a member of the Methodist Church. So all these clues kind of combined to show me that they were all members of the Methodist Church. And although I don't have a record of William Keaton, the father, being a part of that church, it would make sense because of the pattern of religion passing on from parents to children that he was also a member. You can also find these kind of clues in probate records because they will often talk about where the land was given to after a person's death. So those land and probate records might tell you about the land going to a religious institution. So one of the things that can help is just knowing where your ancestor originated. What was their national origin and was there a state church in the home country? For instance, many, many Irish immigrants were Roman Catholic. Danish immigrants, you mentioned our Danish ancestors, were part of the Lutheran Church. So learning about the history of the churches in the country of the origin of your ancestor could give you a clue and could help you start formulating some plans for research once they've come into the United States. Or if you're researching in another country, understanding what the state religion was. I know a lot of the European research that is your bread and butter are those church records. And so you already probably know all about those. United States is a little bit trickier because people came from all over. One of the really fun things that I found when I was working on an article about this, which you can find on Family Lock, it will link into the podcast show notes, is a map. And it's from Wikimedia Commons. And it shows the ancestry of the majority of the population in the United States in the county. And It will tell you, for instance, that there were a great amount of Irish in a certain county. And so then you could think, okay, so Irish were often Catholic, and you could look for records there. And so sometimes just having an idea of where people were from in your county and what the state religion was of that immigrant group can get you started. Also, it's really helpful to know what churches were in the area that your ancestor resided. Last time I talked a little bit about state churches and Virginia during the 1700s had a state religion. It was the Church of England or Episcopal or Anglican. Those all refer to the same religion. So you would want to look for your ancestor in those records. Now I did an interesting project several months ago and it was in Virginia in this early time period. And I had an idea that possibly the ancestor might have been Quaker because a man of his same name was found in Pennsylvania in a marriage record, and I believe it was Quaker. But I wasn't sure. You know, this is another one of those kind of men of the same names. Is this the ancestor or is this another man? But I never could find this man in any of the Church of England records. And the parish he was living in. He was there in other records, but not in the church records. So that was a little piece of indirect evidence that he possibly could have been a Quaker. That is not solved yet. That was the early 1700s. But, you know, be thinking about if they're not listed in the state religion, no, maybe they were the non-state religion. They were the ones that were a little bit different. And that could help to really identify your ancestor figuring out which one is which. So Nicole already mentioned there's city directories that will tell you what kind of churches were there. Local histories are fabulous with listing the churches. So one of the things I always teach is to go after the county histories or if there's a town history. And that's one of the things they always list. They always have a section on churches and they'll often have a picture of the church. They'll say when it started and they'll tell the ministers. And that can be very helpful. And you can look through the book and and say, oh, there was only one church. My ancestor must have gone to this one if they did go. Or you can look through and see that this little town had 10 different churches and 10 different denominations. And so then you're going to know, wow, they could have gone to any one of these churches. You know, there is often a certain denomination that's just prominent in the area and that most people went to, and that's where you could start if you have no idea in looking in the records of that specific place. So it's a little bit of a trick to figure out what church your ancestor might have attended, and you just are going to have to do searching. That's why we love what we do. We are detective genealogists, right, Nicole? (laughs) All right. 
Another thing you can do, which I just learned about in my SLIG class, is look at the social statistics schedule of the United States federal census. And from what I've learned in the last couple weeks, which is not a lot, but it sounds like the schedules that contain these social statistics are available for cities or a specific geographic area within a county. It doesn't gather information about individuals, but statistical data. And what the example that we looked at in the class was a city in Pennsylvania, I think it was Philadelphia, and it listed all of the churches that were in that area. And it even listed different newspapers that were in that area. And several of the newspapers were religious newspapers. So it was fascinating. And if you're not sure which religions were available in that area that you're researching, you can check this social statistics schedule. And I will put a link to the Family Search Wiki article about social statistics schedules in the show notes so that you can read more about it. But they are available from 1850 to 1880. And they tell you more about the real estate, taxes, schools, libraries, newspapers, and church denominations. And it will even tell you the number of people a church can seat. So it can be really helpful to kind of get an idea of what's going on in that area as far as the churches. All right. So now I'm going to go through my example of how I figured out that the Keatons were Methodist and just kind of show you the different records that told me that that was their denomination. So the first thing that I had found about the Keatons was a deed. And the deed was from two brothers, well, brother-in-law, and it was my ancestor, my third great-grandfather, George Welch, and his brother-in-law, William Keaton. The deed said that they accepted $200 from the Reverend Whitefield Anthony. It didn't say Reverend spelled out. It just had the abbreviation R-E-V-T, Reverend or Reverend Whitefield Anthony. And it says that they sold him 99 acres of land on Hencoop Creek, a branch of Rocky River. And then it said that that was a part of a tract of land where William Keaton, deceased, formerly resided. And the deed was made on 14 April, 1833. And they signed the deed and it was recorded in 1834. And I went over that record several times trying to figure out if that meant that he was a reverend, that they were selling the land to a church or what it meant. And I just had that clue in the back of my mind. And then as I found one of their other brothers, Archibald Keaton, and researched him and saw that he was buried in a Methodist church cemetery, that also solidified my hypothesis that that was a deed to a church. Then I found another deed on US GenWeb. And this was, a, I would say, an authored source. It was a person who had gone to some cemeteries in Anderson County, South Carolina, and one of them was called the Smith's Methodist Church Cemetery. And all the gravestones were kind of broken down, and it was just a cow pasture now. And the person was kind of describing it and giving an inventory of all of the graves that he could read there. And one of the things he included in his webpage was the first deed to that church, which listed the names of the trustees. And so he said, the above church was located off County Road number 200, which in turn leads off Airline Road below Miller's Grocery. The first deed to this church was made on September 4th, 1833 by John and Mary McPhail. The trustees named were William Elrod Sr., John Elrod, and Archibald Keaton. Archibald is buried at Ebenezer Cemetery, which is another Methodist church. So in this webpage, this person had shared some original sources that showed that Archibald Keaton was a trustee and buried in a Methodist church cemetery. So then I had more evidence that the Keatons were all part of the Methodist church. So what I did next was I contacted the Ebenezer church, which still exists there in Anderson County, but I did not get a response. So I would need to either call them or try another way of contacting them. I also contacted Philip Stone, who's a Wofford College archivist. Wofford College is a depository for early Methodist church records. And I emailed him and asked him if they had any Methodist church records for the Ebenezer church, including the Keaton family. And he responded and said, 
that he checked and they don't have any records from that specific church. But he said, if that church is still open, then the local church may, may have the records itself. And he said that the local churches there are responsible for their records unless they are closed. And when they close, they're supposed to send their records to the archives. But he said that doesn't always happen. So he said that in either case, we have no records from that congregation. And generally in the early 19th century, the Methodist churches in that area didn't leave behind many records. So contacting the repository is really helpful for understanding what's extant and where to look. So I would probably try again next to contact the Ebenezer Church since they're still open and see if anybody has any records there in the back room. <laughs> and then, of course, lastly, I found an obituary record in a newspaper that talked about one of the other Keaton daughters, Mariah, being a member of the Methodist Church for 20 years. So that's kind of my case study of the religion of the Keaton family. Okay, so I love several things that you said there. For one thing, you just kept working. You looked for several different sources. And I think that's key in church records, that this is not just a one-and-done search thing. You've really got to broaden your mind and think about all the different places where you could find records. And you're still not done, right? You still want to go even more local and try to find if there are records in that specific church. So just know anyone listening and you're thinking, man, I don't know if I want to get into this. Well, this may not be the first thing that you do doing church records research, but eventually you'll probably want to do this, especially if you're stuck and you don't know what else to do. This could really hold the key to your research problem. So let's just talk about some key strategies for how to find these church records. I talked about already to determine which religion your ancestor may have practiced. And once you kind of have an idea, or maybe you have, still have no idea, but if you've done all that you can to figure it out, then the next thing you can do is make a timeline and figure out where he lived in every single period of his life so that you'll know where to search from. You have to keep in mind, and I think we kind of got an idea from Nicole's case study, that there are so many different places to look for church records. They could be at the local church. They could have been donated to the local historical or genealogical society. They could have been donated to the state library or archive, or perhaps that denomination has got a central archive. And this is the case in many, many denominations. They'll have a central place where all the Baptist records have been gathered for the Southeast or all of the Methodist records have been gathered. And often those archives are not even in the state where your ancestor was living, but they've all been gathered into a central place. University libraries also can hold these collections. So it's a wide variety of places where these records might be. Now, just for an example of this, one of my projects is researching an individual who immigrated to Australia in 1855, I believe, and I'm trying to find a birth record for this individual in Brooklyn in the early 1840s. Well, the family was Irish Catholic, and there are records that are extant then. So now my quest is, which record, which one of those churches? And you can only guess how many Catholic churches there are in Brooklyn. But I was able to locate a map and through a lot of kind of some internet searching, narrow it down to figure out where this family was probably living. And now I am circling out and I'm just going to the closest church and contacting them. Each one has to be contacted directly to have them do a search. And I've got one reply back that no records there. So now I'm going to the next one. And then I'm going to continue widening that circle because those records are not online and they are only available in that particular church. The lesson learned here is that you've got to do some due diligence. Sometimes you just have to call and ask and find out exactly where the records are and where you can find them. Now, a really nice place to start your search is the Family Search Research Wiki. And you can type in the locality and search records into the search box, or you can search just by denomination. 
and hopefully you'll find some really good things to point you to where you can research. So using that, remember I wanted to find a little bit more about the Baptist records for my ancestor. I discovered through the wiki that the Samford University Library website has Baptist records. And that will be my next avenue of research for looking for a possible church record because they have gathered in a lot of those records. And so I'm hoping that maybe I'll find that Mount Hickory Baptist congregation and find my Royston ancestors there. My guy was a prominent man in the community, and I would think that there might be more on him. So I'm kind of excited to think about, you know, that next avenue of research. Cool. I think this is really challenging trying to track down these Baptist church records and Methodist church records in the South. I just think a lot of the time these manuscripts might have been kept in the family of the minister. And I'm kind of wanting to go search like in the Nukmuk, you know, the manuscript collections archive grid and look for all these different places that might have a collection that could be related. Because I think it's just a lot of the time not in the usual place that you might think to look. So it's challenging. So next you can try searching major websites like Ancestry.com, MyHeritage, Find My Past. And you can use the keyword search in their card catalogs of each website to enter the religion that you're looking into. And you can include that keyword search with the location. So an example would be to type in Catholic New York, and then you could find some databases that might be about Catholic records in New York. However, if you don't find any collections that relate to your locality and religion in those major websites, you can try the Family Search catalog next. And use the place search, and then when you get to the county that your ancestor lived in, select the category Church Records to see what might be available online or at the Family History Library. And it really just depends on the county. Some counties have a lot of church records available and some don't have very many at all. You'll find that in the northern states and the colonies in the north, they had a lot of church records. And like we've mentioned in the southern states, there aren't as many, except for in Virginia, where they had the state church for a while and they have a lot of parish records for the Episcopal or Anglican church. Another way you can search in the Family Search catalog is to do a keyword search for the denomination and the location, and then you can use the filters on the side to narrow down the year and the category and whether or not it's available online. So we really recommend the Family Search catalog for finding new records to search. You can also go to Cindy's list, and she has a bunch of records listed in her Religion and Churches category, and then she has 14 major United States religions with links to helps for each religion. So Cindy has compiled an excellent resource here that you can use. She also has links to different church histories, which can help you understand what records might have been created and their genealogical value. You can also go to the U.S. GenWeb Church Records Project. They have index records for each state, and some states have a lot of good collections to look through and others just a handful. So when you're doing your research like a pro process and you're doing your locality guide, it's a great idea to find out a lot about the churches in your county or whatever level your locality guide is on. But you can find out the major religions for that county and any church histories that are there for the county and what collections you can find relating to those. And then anytime you're searching in that county again, you can just get out your locality guide and see exactly what's available. All right. So another thing that... We often don't think about our periodicals and periodicals are so interesting. Just a little bit of background on them for a long time. Genealogical and historical societies have been publishing what we call quarterlies. So once a quarter, they would put together a publication and send that out to all their membership. And you never know what you're going to find in these periodicals. Like one of them might have a list of all the members of the church of 1880 that someone just happened to have, and they published it in a periodical in, say, 1940. So how do you ever go about tracking down these articles that might have your ancestor or really be very beneficial for your research? Well, the Allen County Library, several years ago, 
started PERSI, which is an acronym for the Periodical Source Index. And now that is housed on Find My Past. And it's so helpful because now you can search it digitally. You can type in any kind of a location. You can type in a surname. You can put in just church records, history, biography, so many different ways of searching. And you can find where an article might be for your location about a church record. Now, you may get lucky and it might have been digitized or possibly not. And here's where interlibrary loans can come into play because you could see if your library could get a copy of that periodical from another library and have it sent directly to you. Or maybe using WorldCat, you can find that that periodical is housed in a library near you. There's so many different ways to access the periodicals that you find in Percy, but just know it's something worthwhile to play around with and see if you can find that article that might be very helpful for you. So I just used this on my project where I, I talked about a little bit in the last episode of separating men of the same name. And I was researching Swedes who had immigrated to Massachusetts. And I did a search for that. And I found several articles that were very, very helpful. They didn't ever reference the actual ancestor, but gave so much key information about why people were coming to the area and where they all lived within the big metropolitan area and their occupations it was incredibly helpful for getting the backstory and the social history. So that's something to keep in mind also with researching these church records. If we don't find our ancestor in a specific record, that's okay. If we know they were belonging to the Quaker church and we find periodical articles about what that was like at that time period about the Quakers in the time period, even if our ancestors aren't mentioned, it gives us so much background on what their lives might have been like, how they worshipped, you know, what it was like to be a Quaker in that area. So Percy periodicals, another great way to maybe find out more about the church record. So a note on Percy, we were both talking about this recently, <laughs> that if you want to search Percy, you have to go to find my past, which is great that they're keeping that there on find my past now, but they have kind of two different pages to search Percy and one of them works really well and the other one doesn't. So the one that you want is search.findmypast.com slash search slash periodical dash source dash index. And I'll put that in the show notes. The one that you don't want is the other one, which I'll also put in the show notes because <laughs> that one, it makes you like put the exact name of each periodical and then it tells you have zero results. So it can be really frustrating if you've been using that and not finding what you're looking for. Isn't that weird? <laughs> yes. In fact, the funny thing was I had used the one that's that I like better and found all these articles. Then I went back and I was repeating that search using the other web page. I could not find them again. So yes, go to the show notes, use the URL that we give you that's the best one and you'll have much better results. It's just one of those little odd things that we have to learn when we're doing our online searches, right? Yeah, for some reason they just have two different search pages for Percy and one of them doesn't work well. It's kind of like one is a catalog and one is a database. Like if you know the exact name of the periodical that you're wanting to find, you can type that in and you can find it and then browse through the article titles. But if you're just searching for keywords, then that one won't work very well. Right. All right. Let's talk about another way to find church records. So if you're doing United States research, you can look at these historical records surveys that were created in 1938 to 1942 by the Works Progress Administration, better known as the WPA. And these were just inventories of church records in many states. And it's really neat because this historical record survey was kind of the first time that they did a big archival survey in the United States to find out what records were available. So if you want to find these surveys that were done back in the 1930s and 40s, just go to the Family Search catalog and type in historical record survey, and there will be like over 4,000 results. But you can narrow that search by 
putting in church within your search. So historical record survey church, and then you'll get down to only about 500 results. And then if you have a specific place that you want to find those surveys for, just put in the place name, like the state of Georgia, and then the results will be down to only 12. And you can look through and see if there's any information that's helpful to you within Georgia. So one example that we found is the inventory of the Church Archives of Georgia, Atlanta Association of Baptist Churches, affiliated with Georgia Baptist Convention. So this is just a list of all the different churches and what records they had in 1938 to 1942. So if you're not sure what's available and what records existed, this is a great way to find out. And then you can track down those records from there. So check it out. And that is available on the Family Search catalog. Yeah, I love those WPA records. They're so interesting because their task was to go in and just inventory an entire county with everything and not only church records, but lots of other inventories. So if you've never heard of those, do a little playing around with those and see what you can find in them. My husband tells me all the time, people just don't know where you find all these interesting records. So that's what I love about those podcasts is we get to talk about all these interesting records and hopefully give you new ideas of places to search besides Ancestry.com and hints, right? There's so much more to our genealogy than, <laughs> than what is readily available online. So true. And that reminds me that I wanted to go back to when I mentioned the NUCMUC, which is the National Union Catalog of Manuscript Collections. And I will put a link to this in the show notes, but you can search this through the Library of Congress. They have a gateway for searching it. And this is just 1.5 million catalog records that describe the manuscript collections held at different locations throughout the United States, like universities, colleges, and any other kind of public libraries or special libraries located throughout the United States and even in North America and the world, it says. So you can search through these for different collections that might not be available online or on microfilm, but only in paper or manuscript collections. And you have to go to the university, to their special collections library to view that. And that may be where you find some of these rare church records that hold the key to your brick wall. So never discount those manuscript materials. And we hear people say sometimes that, oh, everything's online now. And it does feel like that because there is so much online. But we just have to recognize that sometimes we don't even know what's out there to know if everything's online, right? Because there are still hundreds and thousands of papers that are just held in archives, and you can only get two by going there. And this is something that I always wonder about, like, well, what records do I just not know about? So Mm -hmm. it's helpful to kind of know where you can look for those. So the National Union Catalog of Manuscript Collections, Archive Grid, and the Family Search Catalog. Where else do you look for those? I think this is where the locality guide portion of the Research Like a Pro process is so handy. And you mentioned this either in the previous episode or earlier on in this one, because anyone listening might be getting a little overwhelmed with thinking of all of these different places to search and where to keep track of them. Mm -hmm. And this is where your locality guide is perfect. For instance, if you have a state guide, I have an Alabama state guide. So on there, I have a section that has where manuscript collections are held in the state of Alabama. And, you know, it's at various libraries. And you can discover that once and for all. And then you can put it in your locality guide so that next time you're doing some research and you're thinking, okay, where are those manuscript collections again? And what is in them? You go to your locality guide and you already have it figured out. You already know And whenever you're discovering a new record collection or something new, you have a place to put that so that you can save yourself time down the road. That's why I'm so passionate about keeping track of this kind of stuff so that we don't keep spinning our wheels and and repeating our searches over and over. That we, We make our locality guides and we figure out, you know, where the records are kept and where we can find them for each location we're researching. And then it just helps us to be so much more clear. And also keep in mind that church records can be part of your research plan. Remember, if you're following Research Like a Pro, that we don't just go skipping and hopping through 
things through these different repositories and archives without a plan. So if you have done the easier research, and we highly recommend that you prioritize your research plan and you start with the things that are easier and then church records might be down your list a little bit because they are more difficult and they may be something that you do after you have done the easy searches and not found anything or when you want to just expand your knowledge of the family. So just keep in mind that there's a process. You're not just out there jumping around on the internet. There's a process for figuring out how to do church record research. That's a good reminder. I think it's tempting to go, I'm going to go search all the church records of my ancestors now because I've listened to this podcast. And when I was creating my religion pedigree, it was tempting to go and do that. But I just decided to put unknown for the ancestors who I didn't have a religion for. And then I just put everything that I knew you know, I looked at the sources I already had for my ancestors and just put the religions that I knew. And now I have a bunch of projects that I can do to find out the religions of my unknown religion ancestors. <laughs> right. I love that. So you might have a whole research project that is just to discover church records and the religion. And you would start with your objective and your locality guide would kind of feature that. And you would just follow the process all the way through for that specific objective of discovering religion and church records. So that could be easily its own project all in and of itself. Wow. Okay. That was a lot that we talked about today. We hope you guys enjoyed our podcast series on church records and we're going to wrap it up. So we will talk to you guys again next week. All right, everybody have fun with your research until next time. All right. Bye. Thank you for listening to Research Like a Pro with Diana Elder, accredited genealogy professional, and Nicole Dyer. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your own genealogy research. If you like what you heard, please leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher, or visit our website, familylocket.com, to contact us. You can find our book, Research Like a Pro, A Genealogist's Guide, on Amazon.com and other booksellers. We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.